Welcome back, everyone. Old Man Sethus here, and this week we are going to be taking on a few different stories, but they're all going to be following under one umbrella. Umbrella, umbrella, yay, yay, yay. We're going to be talking about content creation and the incredibly tenuous relationships sometimes that we have not only with the platforms that we present ourselves on, but also with the media that we use to do so. So stick around. This one's going to be really, really good. So this last week, we saw two two different content creators on both Twitch and YouTube get either knocked by the platform itself or by the primary source of the media they use to actually create their content. Our lead story, however, is actually going to be going back a little bit of a ways, and this one actually includes Nintendo going after one of its biggest Zelda creators on YouTube. At the beginning of this month, YouTube creator Point Crow, an unabashed Zelda superfan, was actually hit by Nintendo with a few different DMCA takedowns. Now, what's crazy about this is that it only came about after him uploading some footage that he had actually created that contained a mod for Breath of the Wild. He actually went out and got a mod made that allowed him to play it multiplayer. It's very much worth noting that this particular mod contained no Nintendo assets. Now, the major problem with this case is that up until this point, Point Crow had been uploading content that did include modded material for Breath of the Wild, and literally no repercussions had come back from Nintendo. So in response, Point Crow actually got back to Nintendo asking that they reach out to him to come to a better conclusion than what they were doing with them just hammering away at his content with the MCA violations. He actually said, and I quote, Please remove these strikes and claims or at least start a dialogue with us so we can all move forward with the excitement I'm sure you would love to see about your future games. This doesn't really seem like a huge ask coming from someone who actually is doing their college best to keep one of a, like Nintendo's older titles relevant. Breath of the Wild is six years old. So what was Nintendo's response? More takedowns, baby. Let's just get in there and hammer away at this guy like they're coming for our firstborn child. Absolutely ridiculous in my estimation. So as of this recording, Point Crow has actually shared a graphic of all the different videos that Nintendo has actually come for, including recently titles that don't even include Breath of the Wild. Some of them were modded, some of them were not modded, but it all included is covering over 55 million views of his content. Not really a small amount when it comes to a creator that spends a lot of time and effort on their product and also makes their livelihood from it. It's also worth noting that in the same time frame, another YouTube creator by the name of Croton has had a lot of his stuff come under fire as well. He's had no less than 10 of his live streams get DMCA takedown by Nintendo and two actual videos. So it kind of seems that Nintendo is out headhunting and we're not really entirely sure what suddenly set them off. Now, I have a lot of opinions about this as a fellow content creator and someone who live streams, and they're all pretty strong. When, when we sit down and we present our interactions with these games to people out there who consume it, we are doing so in a way that we want to entertain them because we love doing this. We love the games that we're playing or the other mediums that we're actually using to make this content. And when a company supports us, we have a better time of doing it. And the reason that we have a better time doing it is because we know we're supported by it. We don't have to step on eggshells. We don't have to worry about X, Y, or Z. And we know that our livelihood isn't going to suddenly get undercut from us because having that company or that uh, platform, in some cases, have our back, knowing that they are getting some benefit from it as well, it makes our job a hell of a lot easier. Not to mention that in a lot of these cases, we're actually keeping things relevant. As someone who made a lot of their like way on the platforms that I use right now by way of Darkest Dungeon, a very old game, I was able to actually keep that game relevant for Red Hook. In this case, you have people like Croton and Point Crow keeping a game that's six years old, being Breath of the Wild, relevant for Nintendo. Making it continually relevant as time marches on should only serve Nintendo even if it is being modded, because this game is that old and you might actually get new sales from it. People will actually find this content and then they will want to be able to play it themselves. So why wouldn't they go out and buy it? Thus supporting Nintendo, why doesn't Nintendo have their backs? So where is this leading? Well, not really surprisingly, both Croton and Point Crow have expressed their apparent lack of uh, interest or at least their fear of wanting to actually produce any content for Tears of the Kingdom. They are both under the impression that if Nintendo is going to come back at them for some stuff that they've already done, some stuff that they've already produced, modded or not, and Nintendo has shown that, you know what, we're not going to let you do this, why would they want to continue to actually make content for Nintendo and their properties? 
it's pretty understandable that they're pretty gun shy about this and I don't know if Nintendo's necessarily thinking this one through. I know that Tears of the Kingdom is going to do very, very well for Nintendo, but at the same point in time, I don't know if it's necessarily gonna do as well as maybe even something like Breath of the Wild, because when you have content creators out there keeping that game relevant, you're just gonna get sales as time goes on. Of course, the hype's gonna be there for Tears of the Kingdom. We all know it's gonna do well initially, but if people aren't keeping those titles relevant as time goes on, who knows if Nintendo's actually gonna see back what they thought they were going to when they initially put this game out. We'll comment some more about this a little bit later as we close down after these next two subjects. So stick around for some extra questions and some thoughts and feelings about what all this actually means for people who continue to produce content whether it be on YouTube or Twitch. Now, the next big subject when it comes to a content creator and a platform not really jiving well, this last Tuesday, one of Twitch's biggest content creators, Kai Sennett, actually got banned from the platform. That's right, everybody. One of Twitch's largest and most successful products was banned by the Bleed Purple crew for what is being reported as, quote, repeated explicit simulated activity in GTA. Now, before we go any further, it's worth noting that the ban is apparently temporary and this isn't Kai's first offense. Now, the big thing is, why is this such big news? Kai Sennett has been one of Twitch's largest creators, but over the past year, he has grown by leaps and bounds and has become an even bigger success than he once was. He actually recently cracked Ludwig's all-time Twitch sub record. Kai Sennett actually was able to generate over 300,000 subscribers in a one month period, and that sets a current record that I don't know if we're ever going to see broken anytime soon, but it's impressive to know that he did this and that Twitch was actually willing to take him out because of something that seemed like perceived uh, issues when it comes to him playing a role playing game. To add more fuel to this fire, recent upstart rival to Twitch Kick has actually reached out to Kai and publicly said, hey, you have a spot with us. Not to mention, they've actually put out some material from some of their higher ups, knocking Twitch's decision to actually knock off their biggest creator. Now then, does this particular ban seem justified? Personally, from someone who streams on Twitch, I can see why they did it. When it comes to sexual content, we all know that Twitch likes to say that they're very, very heavy handed about that kind of stuff, even though there are a lot of examples on the platform of them not necessarily giving a rat's ass about whether or not there is something sexually specific going on. This particular enforcement seems a little bit paper thin, especially when you consider how nebulous Twitch's TOS can be when it comes to interpretation and enforcement. They're very, very willing to turn a blind eye in some cases, but then they're very, very willing to actually drop the hammer on somebody who seems like they've done something completely innocent. In these cases, I'm looking at the gal who most recently uh, got some really sweet backdoor playtime action from somebody that she was uh, apparently with. She only got banned for a few days. What? And then you have the majority of, uh, well, I wouldn't say necessarily the majority of uh, body painters out there, but there were a lot of body painters at one point in time who actually were following everything just like they were told they were supposed to, and some of them got lifetime bans. I honestly think in this case, it feels like Twitch is just doing it so they can lean on the whole, hey, look at us, we actually banned somebody. That makes us a lot of money. They actually are a huge name and oh my God. But when you really look at it and you really start digging into it, it kind of seems like Twitch doesn't really care more often than not about you know how it gets interpreted. It's more about the optics and whether or not they might look like the good or bad guy ultimately. We'll cover this a little bit more right here at the end and talk about like all the ramifications of it. But we have one more instance of all this kind of drama going down that happened this last week and it involves the Destiny community. So the last instance we're gonna cover of creator versus brand slash platform is Equagan, I think I'm pronouncing that correctly, and his dust up most recently with Bungie in Destiny 2. It would seem that Equagan is currently being put on blast by Bungie for having leaked uh, NDA material based on upcoming content from one of their expansions. From all the things that I've read, it seems that Equagon is part of the Bungie Community Summit, which is a Discord server that they actually keep in contact with members of their community so that they can start gathering information. Destiny, or rather Bungie, puts up upcoming things from future installments so they can get feedback from prominent creators and other folks so that they can start doing the right thing. Developers actually do that where they reach out to established community members and get feedback about the game to see if it's gonna be something that they may actually want to put in or if there's a little bit of work to do. The accusation from Bungie 
is that Equagon actually took some of this information from the server and has started disseminating it in other places, whether it be in other discords, taking videos of it and sharing it with other people, even putting it in DMs, and subsequently ruining some top secret information that is actually covered by NDAs. Now, as a content creator, these are incredibly, incredibly big accusations when it comes to NDAs. When we as creators sign NDAs, we are actually on the hook for never disseminating that information lest we can be sued and not for an unsubstantial amount of money, considering this is all possibly in development stuff or top secret stuff, or just generally things that the developer doesn't want the public to know of just yet. It's also worth noting here that Bungie feels that they have irrefutable evidence that this all went down, but I think most of us, and, and by most of us, I mean even you all watching the video, we all know that the digital age is a really crazy and weird place and that it can be very possible for people to actually forge this kind of stuff. Equagon has actually vehemently, vehemently maintained his innocence on this, basically claiming just that, that somebody on Discord has actually framed him for all of this. I feel like it's worth noting here that if you're a Discord user like I am, we all know that there is a lot of shady stuff that goes on on the platform. I think that we can all agree whether we're getting hit up by digital artists, whether you're getting hit up by someone randomly for some kind of crazy offer in some random Discord, these kind of things actually occur. I think it's entirely possible, and I think that I may actually believe Equagon that this might be the case. Now, this is conjecture, but giving my knowledge of the creator space, this could actually be one creator trying to get over on another. I've been part of this before. I've seen this happen uh, in the industry before, where one person may be jealous of something, where one person might want the the accolades that this other person's getting, and they might actually do things that will sabotage this person's efforts in the space that they're trying to exist in. The industry as a whole can be incredibly cutthroat, so if this is actually the case, uh, well, you know what? I'm actually not gonna be that surprised. Equagon has even come out and asked, why? Why would I even do this? There, there's literally no reason for me to do this. Why would I do this? He's under, and I quote, I'm under, I'm in so many NDAs at the moment, why would I breach any of it? It's part of the job. I, he spent, well, I've spent 14,000 hours on this game, multiple hours helping people in Grandmasters. So it's clear that Equagon actually does care about the community, he cares about the game, and he cares about his livelihood. Why in the hell would he shoot himself in the foot? It literally doesn't make any sense. So what is the point of him actually coming out, sharing this information, and ruining his reputation? So as a fellow content and creator, I agree. This is our livelihood. When we enter into agreements with organizations, we're putting our futures and our reputations on the line. Uh, you know, slip ups happen occasionally. Sometimes we screw up. Sometimes we accidentally say something we shouldn't, or sometimes we actually put the paper something that we shouldn't. But ultimately, when it comes into this realm of NDAs, we always, at least everyone that I've ever talked to, we always mind our business. If we don't mind our business, it's incredibly likely that we will get blacklisted, not only by the people that we're actually working with at that moment, but we're gonna get blacklisted with any kind of future opportunity. I have yet to meet any content creator, no matter how big or small, no matter how wide their reach is, no matter where they're at in their career, that is willing to put out this kind of information when they're under NDA, knowing that they could possibly get screwed as time goes on. It literally doesn't make any sense. Now, as we wrap up this video, what is the end game here? I don't know. All of these instances are incredibly just crazy in my opinion and they all lead to a lot of questions when it comes to how do creators navigate not only the platforms that they broadcast on but how do they navigate the people that they sometimes work with using their media whether it's games or other things a lot of the rules feel very loose nothing really seems hard and fast and the sheer amount of gray area in the entire medium is incredibly daunting so many people who do this including myself we do it because we love it and we want to do it for an incredibly long time. And ultimately, when the rules feel like they're going to change, when the rules feel like they can at any moment just be completely interpreted one way or the other, and we're not really sure how it's going to be done, it can feel incredibly oppressive. It can stymie the creative process. It can make us less happy about doing it. And it can also makes us second guess our living. And I'm probably oversimplifying it here, but I've always been in the camp of, if we're bringing attention to something, we are likely not only helping ourselves, but we're helping the people who own the platform that we're delivering it on, whether it's Twitch or YouTube or the aforementioned Kick, or even to the people that produced the media that we are using 
as the focus of our content. What do you all think? Are we as creators getting too comfortable? Should it be ultimately the case where we need to start doing more due diligence? Do we need to start getting more stuff in writing? Conversely, are all these different platforms or organizations or companies getting too up in their feels about what content creators are doing? Do they potentially not see the benefit that people like me are actually bringing to their products? Are they potentially not seeing how this is actually a huge help for them in the long run? Whatever the case may be, give it all to us below. Give me any of your thoughts. Answer the questions that I threw out there. Let me know what y'all are thinking because I'm genuinely curious where a lot of you, both creator and consumer of a lot of this content are. Thanks again for watching this week, everyone. I hope you enjoyed it and I'll see you next week.